The subject of our discussion today is Moses' song, Deuteronomy chapter 32. And most of all, try to figure out what its purpose is. What is it here for? What are we supposed to learn from it? As we shall see, despite the fact that at first brush, it's pretty hard to figure out altogether what we learn from it, it is indeed a song that transformed the world and transforms us. But first, let's review what the song tells us. It begins with what we could best describe as words of introduction. Give ear, you heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. And what then follows is the content itself. Let's move on to the actual content per se. When we read in verse 3, I will proclaim the name of God, ascribe greatness unto our God. And the description of God in particular is an affirmation of his justice. The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness, without iniquity, just and right is he. And therefore, is corruption his? No. His children's is the blemish, a generation crooked and perverse. And what follows then is a woeful description of that perversity. That is, after, in particular, in verses 7 and 8, a reminder about history. Remember the days of old. And remember what God has done. Beginning with verse 9, we read in particular what God did for his people. For the portion of God is his people, Jacob, the lot of his inheritance. And then the description of how God so solicitly attended to all of the needs of Israel in the wilderness. God alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and so on, and gave Israel such prosperity that the result was spiritual ruin. Verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. You waxed fat, you grew thick, you became gross, and he forsook God who made him and contemned the rock of his salvation. They provoked his zeal with alien practices, with abominations did they provoke him. A description of the idolatrous abominations in which they engaged. By summation, of the rock that begot you, you were unmindful, you forgot God who bore you. And beginning in verse 19, the consequences. The consequences God saw and spurned because of the provoking of his sons and daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. They roused me to jealousy with a no God provoke me with their vanities, I will rouse them to jealousy with a no people, a non-people. We might even think about trying to dance, but we won't discuss that right now. I will provoke them with a vile nation. And there is, in graphic terms, a description of the calamitous results, the wasting of hunger, the devouring of a fiery bolt, bitter destruction, the teeth of beasts will ascend upon them, the venom of crawling things of the dust, Without shall be the sword, bereaved, and in the chamber terror, slaying both young men, virgin, the suckling with the man of great hairs, and perhaps the most terrifying verse of all, verse 26, I thought I would make an end of them. I would make their memory cease from among men. Almost. Utter destruction. Except. Verse 27. Were it not that the enemy's wrath was heaped up, lest their adversaries should misdeem, lest they should say, 
our hand is exalted, and not God has wrought all this, for they are a nation void of counsel, and there is no understanding in them. And, you know, I must admit that it's not clear in context. If the nation void of counsel here is Israel, who has sinned, or the enemy. The enemy that is the rod of punishment in God's hand against Israel, but who now thinks he is in business for himself, and God has nothing to do with it. And so the continuation, verse 29, if they were wise, if who was wise, again, could be referring to Israel, could be referring to their adversaries. They would understand this. They would discern their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight, except the rock had given them over and God had delivered them up? For their rock is not as our rock. This is, after all, the realization. Their gods are, of course, powerless. They are fictions. Even our enemies themselves being judges. Some commentators propose that the second clause here is saying, even our enemies recognize that their gods have no power. Only the one and only true God. And since they are not then recognizing this lesson, God says, verse 34, is not this laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries. Vengeance is mine and recompense against the time when their foot shall slip. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that are to come upon them shall make haste. Whose calamity? Israel's or their enemies? Still not clear. And verse 36 perhaps best amplifies the ambiguity. We could render the Hebrew as, for God will judge his people, judge, indict. And by consequence, there is punishment. Alternatively, the Hebrew yadin can mean, for God will take up the cause of his people, judge on their behalf and comfort his servants when he sees that their stay is gone and there's none remaining shut up or left at large. So once again, at the risk of confusing the matter, I'm going to stress, this could be seen as part of God's response to Israel's sins, the punishment could be seen as God's response to the brazen arrogance of their enemies, God's retribution against them. And the continuation in verse 37, again, it's really not clear. And it is said, or, and he will say, referring to God, where are their gods, the rock in whom they trusted who did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let him rise up and help you. Let him be your protection. Who says it to whom? Is God saying it to Israel? Is God saying it to Israel's enemies? Is Israel saying it to its enemies? Are the enemies saying it to Israel? To be completely above board, I should admit that all four of those possibilities exist among the Bible scholars studying this passage. They're all legitimate renditions of the Hebrew. So we don't know in any definitive way who's asking the question or even to whom. But it certainly is this challenge. Where are those other gods? And unequivocally, verse 39 is God speaking. See now 
that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I have wounded, and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And the final definitive conclusion in the verses that follow, for I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live, or as I am like forever, if I whet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my adversaries and will recompense them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the first breach of the enemy. There is that final definitive accounting and the consequence. The final verse of the song. Sing aloud, O you nations of his people, for he does avenge the blood of his servants and does render vengeance to his adversaries and does make expiation for the land of his people. There is, ultimately, justice. It may not be obvious to us. I dare say it's not obvious to us. We look around at the world, we see an awful lot of injustices surrounding us. There is this final accounting. But, you know, at first brush, we still need to ask the question, what is this song coming to teach us that we didn't already know? After all, while certainly a major theme is crime and punishment, Israel's sins and the consequences of those sins, in the onslaught of the enemy. We know that already. There have been many passages heretofore in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, in which we read precisely about the theme of crime and punishment. Most recently, we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 15, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command you this day to love God your Lord, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances. Then you shall live and multiply, and God your Lord will bless you in the land where you are coming to possess. And what follows, well, I didn't include the verses here, but verses 17 and 18 are what happens if you don't. The punishment. Verse 19, by way of summation, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. You have both possibilities. You know, just as was expressed in verse 15, there's life and good and death and evil. And the summons, the divine plea, therefore, choose life that you may live, you and your seed, because whatever you choose, there will be consequences. When you choose life, when you choose to follow in God's ways, then you choose the blessing. If you choose to turn your back on all that, you choose death, you choose the curse, it's all up to you. So we know that already. That certainly isn't the purpose of Deuteronomy chapter 32. We've learned it previously. Could it be to teach us the end of the story? The final divine conciliation when God rescues us and becomes manifest to all who see God's salvation, we know that as well. Actually, that was an earlier theme in Deuteronomy chapter 30, at the beginning of the chapter. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you shall be- bethink yourself among all the nations where God has driven you, and shall return to God your Lord and hearken to his voice according to all that I command you this day, you children, with all your heart and with all your soul, then God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you, and will return and gather you from all the peoples where God has scattered you. If any of you are 
dispersed in the uttermost parts of heaven. From there will God your Lord gather you, and from there he will fetch you. And God your Lord will bring you into the land that your father has possessed. And you shall possess it, and he will do you good and multiply you above your fathers. And God your Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed who love God your Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So, the conciliation, the promise, the ultimate redemption, we knew that as well. That too can't possibly be the purpose of Deuteronomy chapter 32. Maybe an important key to resolving this riddle, to understanding what Deuteronomy chapter 32 is for, is to consider what God says in the previous chapter, in chapter 31. When he talks about this song, gives Moses the mandate. What is it for? In chapter 31, verse 19. Now, therefore, write you this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land that I swore unto their fathers, flowing with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten their fill and waxen fat and turned unto other gods and served them, and despised me, and broke my covenant, then it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are come upon them, that this song will testify before them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed, for I know their imagination, how they do even now, before I brought them into the land that I swore. And so Moses wrote this song the same day, and taught it to the children of Israel. Now, when we consider what was stated in particular in verse 21, That this song shall testify before them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. On the one hand, verse 21 contains a powerful, extraordinary promise. This song will never be forgotten. This song, by extension, the Torah, that includes this song within it will never be lost. In substance, the same guarantee that we read in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, my spirit that is upon you and my words that I put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed's seed, says God, from henceforth and forever. That word, that word of God, endures. So that, of course, is one of the aspects in verse 21. But in addition, we need to clarify what is this testimony, that this song shall testify before them as a witness. Likewise, of course, in verse 19, that this song may be a witness. Witness. What? I submit to you that this idea of being a witness, testimony, this bearing of witness, not so much the particular specific contents of the song, but just what it is to which this to song testifies is one of the most critical messages that God communicated to the world and one of the most important lessons for all the world to learn. You know what we learn from Deuteronomy chapter 32? We learn about history. About history and its significance. Now, let me explain what I mean by this, because I realize that sounds like a very vague general statement, and 
What do you mean we learn about history? So maybe a good way of expressing this is by noting an interesting comparison. When we compare Eastern religions and ideologies with Western religions and ideologies, by and large, this is a bit of a simplification, but I think it still is a valid comparison. In Eastern religions and ideologies, world history is something that cycles. A circle that ultimately seeks its beginning. And so on manifold planes, the whole conception of the world is this ongoing cyclical process that inexorably returns to its starting point. And in the West, in practically every Western ideology and religion, you're never returning to the starting point. On the contrary, there's a goal, an ultimate direction. That goal being some kind of utopian destiny, some final resolution, some ultimate completeness. Now, I should clarify what I mean by that. It obviously doesn't mean that the end point is completely divorced from where you started. But still, there is something that is linear in this process. It's not going back to the point of origin. There's something extraordinary taking place in world history. And when we ask ourselves, what caused this divergence between the East and the West? My answer, very simply, is Deuteronomy chapter 32. That is, of course, it goes without saying. Eastern religions and Eastern ideologies, for the most part, developed independently of the Bible because it wasn't known to them. Whereas all Western religions, and for all intents and purposes, all Western ideologies as well, on some plane, integrated the message of the Bible and its view of what this world is all about. The idea of a process unfolding in the world that has some destination necessarily imposes upon us both significance and critically the charge to do what we need to do. Maybe a, a good way to consider this message is by considering Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Behold, this only have I found, says Ecclesiastes, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions, intrigues, contrivances. So on the one hand, there is that starting point. The starting point purely in God, in the unshakable, uncompromising perfection of the divine. Well, uh, consider in that vein the way the song begins. For I will proclaim the name of God, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, perfect, all his ways are justice. Same idea, essentially. But then they sought many contrivances. Something happened. We went our own way. Indeed, as expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 32, is corruption his? No. His children's is the blemish. A generation crooked and perverse. We went our own way. And ultimately, the challenge is coming back home. We spoke about this homecoming in a different vein. 
when in the last session we considered the message of the Jubilee year, the cosmic homecoming. But it's part of this as well. The idea of returning, on the one hand, it's going back to God, but it's not simply completing a circle and returning to the point from which you began. Rather, on the contrary, when we consider in this vein just what returning means, there is perhaps an important insight to be gleaned by analogy by considering the physical return of the prophet Samuel, who in Samuel 1, chapter 7, is described as a circuit judge. He would go from place to place. That is, he would go to Beit El and Gilgal and Stab and judge Israel and all those places. And his return was to Ramah. For there was his house. There was his home. On the one hand, returning is always a homecoming. I can't help but note as a kind of parenthetical observation that the Hebrew for return here is utshuvato. Tshuva is a word that means return and also means repent. So of course in context over here, it doesn't talk about repentance, speaking about the prophet Samuel returning home. But that's what repentance means. Repentance always means returning home. So there is the idea then of completing the course and coming back home to God. It's true, but it shouldn't be construed as implying that what we're doing along the way is in any way insignificant. Well, first of all, of course, in the example of the prophet Samuel, what he was doing was very significant. He was judging Israel in all those places. But besides the technicality that every step is significant, when you return home after a life that is meaningfully, significantly lived, you're not simply going back to the same place that you had left. You're higher. You're actualized. And where you return is higher too. So, the message of Deuteronomy chapter 32 in giving you this cosmic blueprint of all the course of history is teaching you about just how important history is and how important what you do in history is. There's an important key here in the narrative of Deuteronomy chapter 32 that I think, think is especially essential in our gleaning this message. This is an idea that inevitably we see expressed in what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. And of course, to that extent, the message in the concluding verses of Deuteronomy chapter 32's song is coming to a realization, an appreciation of God. An idea that, I should note, we find expressed elsewhere in Scripture as well. To cite just two examples, in Isaiah chapter 52, we read, likewise, in the wake of exile, Assyria oppressed Israel without cause. Verse 5, now therefore, what do I hear, says God, seeing that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them howl, says God, and my name, my name continually all day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I, even he that spoke, behold, here I am. Can't help but note the formulation here, that I, even he, in the Hebrew, ki anihu, 
is essentially a paraphrase of what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 32. There is a knee, a knee, who I, even I am he. Same idea. God is introducing himself to the world. And of course, the consequence of that, in the verses that follow, we read of the consequent salvation, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger of good tidings that announces peace, the harbinger of good tidings that announces salvation, that says to Zion, your God reigns. Hark, you watchmen, they lift up the voice. Together do they sing, for they shall see eye to eye God returning to Zion. God comforting his people, redeeming Jerusalem. But as what? As this concern, so to speak, for God's name. Now, before we clarify what that means, one additional example. And here, the theme of the name is arguably even more central. In Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 22, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you came. That is the very fact that Israel is sent to exile. Israel, bearing God's name, bearing the brunt of God's wrath, is a profanation of his name. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations will know that I am God, says God the Lord. But I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. And again, the promise of salvation. I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and will bring you into your own land. There's the restoration, the promise, the purification. And finally, in verse 28, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now, when we consider here, too, this theme of God's name, my holy name that you have profaned among the nations, I will sanctify my great name. Of course, on a childish level, we might think, oh, God's concerned about his name. What is this? God forbid to speak about egotism here. Obviously, God doesn't need our adulation, our praises at all. God isn't affected here, if anything. On a deeper level, we should appreciate when the prophets speak of God's name, the name is only the way we recognize God in our world. It doesn't impinge upon God as God at all. But what does the theme of God's name signify? And again, I'll stress, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when there is the challenge, the question that is raised because of the enemy's wrath, our hand is exalted, and God has not wrought all this, such that, remember this ambiguous question, where are their gods, the rock in whom they trusted? And we aren't sure who's asking the question and to whom the question is being asked. The essential message, who is there other than the one true God? See now that I, even I, am He. You know why this message is so critical, is so central, is so much the crux of the message of Deuteronomy chapter 32? Well, first of all, of course, we should stress what's really the obvious, and that is whatever God does, He does not for His own good, but for our own good. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24, that all that God commanded us, he commanded for our good always. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, now Israel, what does God ask of you? Why well, he's asking of you to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him. Seems to be asking an awful lot. Yeah, but everything he's asking of you is for your own good. To keep the commandments of God, his statutes, that I command you this day, for your own good. It's all for your good. So the name, the name, from our perspective, again, is the way we recognize God in the world. What's so important about God's name and God's concern for his name is, of course, if you know that somebody is defaming your name, would it bother you? Would it matter to you? Answer, it depends. It depends who's defaming your name and where it's being defamed. If the person defaming your name is a criminal, is the most vile human being on earth, and he's doing it in the company of his friends and buddies, who would you care? You might even be happy about it. If it's happening in a place that you esteem, if it's happening, by those who you regard as important, then it's a problem. God's concern for his name is maybe the deepest, most powerful message of God conferring importance, significance on this world. What happens in this world is important. It matters. It matters as it were to God. It should certainly matter to us. The message that it conveys then is just how significant our lives are in this world. Now, I realize I've said a lot in the last few minutes. Let's try to restate this in a simple, straightforward bottom line, as difficult as it is for me. We talked about the significance of history. We talked about a linear process moving toward a destination. That's redemption. And that's a message that informs our attitude with respect to everything that's happening in this world. We're not aiming to attain some level of aloofness and indifference toward this world. On the contrary, what Deuteronomy chapter 32 drives home with relentless force is this world and everything that happens in it is important. God has conferred great significance on this world. God, as it were, is concerned for this world. And to the extent that We've gone off course. That is, again, it always starts out with, as we saw in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, God made man upright. But then we got distracted by our various contrivances and went off the road. And there are consequences. There's punishment. There is an evaluation, a reassessment, and eventually a rapprochement. Because what we do in this world counts. It matters. Deuteronomy chapter 32 is a kind of roadmap for the totality of world history. It's not there to teach you about crime and punishment. We learned that before. It's not even there to teach us about redemption. It's there to teach us that every step along the way is important. 
So you have this song, the whole content of which is telling you, pay attention to history. Pay attention to history. Remember, maybe the first mandate in Moses' song, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, he will declare unto you, your elders, and they will tell you, this is an ongoing process. World history has impact. Deuteronomy chapter 32 tells you to take your life seriously. It tells you to take the world seriously. Don't close your eyes. Don't be aloof. Don't be indifferent. Don't think, oh, it's just my personal relationship with God and all the rest doesn't matter. Or that it's all about God and humanity is inconsequential. Deuteronomy chapter 32 tells you this world is the stage of everything significant that's happening. Pay attention. It makes a difference. Once we appreciate that message, once we appreciate in this vein what follows the concluding words of Deuteronomy chapter 32 are inevitably the crucial culmination of what we've seen. So we return to Deuteronomy chapter 32 now, after the song. And Moses came and spoke all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hosea, son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel, and again the theme of testimony. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto the words wherewith I testify against you this, this day. I am bearing witness. I am bearing witness to the significance of history. I am further emphasizing. And this is the culmination of what Moses says at the conclusion of the song. It is no vain, no empty thing for you. Because it is your life. And your life matters. This world matters. And through this thing, you will prolong your days upon the land, whether you go over the Jordan to possess it. So, of course, this is very much on key with what we already saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 10 about everything being for our own good. But it's not just a matter of everything being for our own good. It's a matter of appreciating that our own good is important. Our lives are important. This world is important. We were put here for an important person purpose. We're here for a reason. Life in this world matters. That's the culmination of Moses' words in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Pay attention. History, the world, your own life, they are all of consequence. They are all important. But that's not the final message in Deuteronomy chapter 32. To consider that final message, there is one last point of consideration that I feel compelled to share with you. And that's what follows immediately after Moses finishes speaking. I have to tell you, at first brush, these words sound so terribly great. Immediately after Moses completes his song, Moses completes his charge to Israel, you'd think maybe God would say, good job, Moses. You did it well. But it doesn't look like that. Instead, verse 48, and God spoke unto Moses, that self-same day, same day, saying, Get you up into this mountain of Avarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. You look, but you're not going. 
and die in the mount where you go up and be gathered unto your people as Aaron your brother died in the mount of Hor and was gathered unto his people. That's the end of the chapter, the grand finale, the crescendo after Moses' song. God says to him, Okay, Moses, you finished now, die. Is that it? And in order to answer this question, this final point that I feel is critical, we need to consider what's the message in this rather exceptional expression that self same day in the Hebrew the etzem hayom chazeh what does it mean what does it signify we know it's the same day don't we and I submit to you the message that in fact is emergent in these verses the end of the chapter when God says to Moses you're finished now it's time to die that message is much deeper much more profound than merely saying to Moses okay Moses job well done no this is much much more than that because if we have been following what Deuteronomy chapter 32 has been communicating to us all along. Again, the importance of history, the importance of this world, the importance of each and every human being whom God places in the world. Then, first of all, general observation. General observation, then everything has its time, everything has its place, everything has its role. As expressed at the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time and an appointed season for all things. So, the date of Moses' death is that insignificant or inconsequential? Nothing is insignificant or inconsequential. And moreover, maybe, maybe God's message to Moses immediately after he completes this song is Moses. You had a mission in this world. You had a purpose. With this song, it's not just a job well done. With the words that you said, with what you have done, and what you have taught your people, you have completed your mission. You're done. It's time to return home to return to God, to be ingathered. Remember the expression here. Not just die. Die in the mount where you go up and be gathered unto your people. That ingathering, that homecoming only happens when you're finished with your job. You're done. And now it's time to come home. And I can't help but add here that this expression, that self same day in Hebrew, etzem hayom hazeh, is one we find in other contexts in the Bible as well, and I think it is instructive to consider briefly at least some of those instances. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. A terrible, devastating flood. Forty days, forty nights. Verse 13. 
In the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Cham and Yafet. And the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. All the earth is being erased because of men's iniquities. Noah, his wife, their three sons and three daughters-in-law are all that will remain. Is this something that we should regard as it just worked out that way. In the self same day, everything is significant. The punishment is of significance. The salvation is of significance. Everything is of significance. And in a similar vein, Exodus chapter 12, Verse 40, now the time that the children of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the self same day. It came to pass that all the hosts of God went out from the land of Egypt. And again in verse 51, and it came to pass the self same day that God did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Same day. Not just telling you that it happened on a certain day. Everything has its time. Everything has its purpose. Everything has its role because this world and everything that happens in it is of importance. And two additional instances of the same expression that we find in Ezekiel. The first, Ezekiel chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. And the word of God came unto me in the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day of the month, saying, Son of man, write you the name of the day, even of this self-same day. This self-same day, the king of Babylon has besieged Jerusalem. The beginning of the siege of Jerusalem to this day commemorated based upon the words of the prophet Zechariah speaking of the fast of the 10th month that was observed as a day of celebration during the second temple period but afterward reverted once again to a day of fasting we continue to fast the beginning of the siege that led to the fall of Jerusalem. And it's not merely a question of military exploits and expeditions of battles waged back and forth. It is again. Son of man, write the name of the day, even of this self-same day. There is a guiding hand in history. Everything has significance. And Correspondingly, in Ezekiel chapter 40, in the five and twenty-fifth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, that is, all those years have elapsed since the self-same day when the siege that led to the smiting of the city began. The prophet doesn't tell us which city, we know. In the self-same day, one can't help but add here that Rosh Hashanah, 10th day of the month, means it's happening on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. The hand of God was upon me and he brought me thither, there, to Jerusalem. Yom Kippur, after all, is that day of cosmic homecoming, as we discussed. In the visions of God, brought me he, he into the land of Israel and set me down upon a very high mountain, whereof was, as it were, the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance 
of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate, and the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with your eyes and hear with your ears and set your heart upon all that I shall show you. For with the intent that I might show them unto you, you are brought here. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. And what does he see? He is shown in the verses that follow the final building of Jerusalem in the future. The final temple ultimately established in its midst. There's a self-same day for destruction. And this self-same day is the beginning of the final deliverance. And again, we're going to reiterate. It's not simply returning to the starting point. It's not simply completing the circle and returning to the point from which we departed. Because were that the case, if we would only be returning to the starting point, then what would that mean? It would mean that everything we did all along the way was really of no consequence at all. All that happened was we went back to the same point from which we had begun. We don't. This homecoming is not to return to the starting point. It's to return to God after lives well lived, fraught with meaning and significance. It is the return that follows a huge linear process, not circular, linear, of growing, developing, bonding to God on a level that we could never possibly have done if we had remained at that starting point all along. So, yes, God made man upright, and they sought many contrivances. And all of Deuteronomy chapter 32 records those many contrivances, those devices and inventions, those derailments and divergences where we went our own way and separated ourselves from God. Deuteronomy chapter 32 teaches us this message, this message of coming back, this message of growing through everything, because everything that happens is important. Because history is significant. And everything happening on that stage of history, both for the world at large and for the individual, everything has significance. Your life is important. Don't waste it. Don't underestimate the significance of your individual life because you were put here as an individual by God in order to accomplish your mission, in order to actualize your purpose. So again, for Moses, the completion of that mission, the fulfillment of that purpose was teaching that message to all of us. That's his song in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And you know, maybe it's especially appropriate here that we appreciate that it's a song. Because in a song, as opposed to mere prose, each line, each nuance is important and is also the greater whole. The greater whole that's more than the sum of its parts. Moses concludes his life in song, and maybe that way he teaches us that everyone's life is a song. We're each here to play a unique melody. We, each of us, has a unique mission to fulfill here. And so, for Moses, so same day that he completes the song, 
he completes his mission, it's time to go home. But for us, here, in the meantime, when we learn that message, when we hear what Moses is teaching us in this song, we redouble our efforts. We redouble our efforts to fulfill our mission, to realize our purpose, to ready the world for God and ready ourselves to return into his presence. God bless you.